Praise the Lord. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord another clap offering. Amen. Why don't you just go out of your way and just, and just welcome two people here that you don't know. Just welcome each other. Amen. We're a friendly church. Don't matter your background, who you are, what you've done, where you've been, who you've, who you've done it with. Amen. We want to show you the love of God and welcome you here uh, to elevate ministries. Just to let y'all know, we're going to talk about marriage today. And some of you who are single, I'm like, why do I got to listen uh, to this? Um, you don't prepare for where you're at. You prepare where you see yourself going. And some of you, like, I'm a player. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll never get married. You're usually the ones that get married first. First of all, let me just tell you that. But start building the foundation about marriage now. So when God sends, when God sends, when God sends on his timing, a God-fearing man or God-fearing woman, you already have that foundation established. Amen. So, and for you, for you married people, for you veterans, for you old G's, there are some things that I'm going to teach about that you may be able to apply immediately. And just like anything else, there are some things that it's going to be a process. And it's going to take time. It's going to take some mistakes. You're going to win some, you're going to lose some, but you got to stick with the process, amen. Can I get amen for that? Amen. If you have your Bible, open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 25, and then we'll skip down to verse 31. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 25, and then we're going to skip down to uh, 31. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Amen. We ought to, husbands and wives ought to submit to each other for God ultimately. For wives, this means to submit to your husband as to the Lord. So it, it's, it's elaborating what submission means giving you examples for a husband is the head of his wife meaning the leader as Christ is the head of the church he is the savior of his body the church as the church submits to Christ so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything everything that is Christ like not nothing illegal if your husband wants you to sell drugs don't be selling drugs for him your husband wants you to stop serving Jesus. How many of y'all know we don't stop serving Jesus? Amen. For husbands, this means, now notice, he tells us, he tells husbands and wives, submit to one another. So for husbands, this is what this means. He's elaborating how you submit to your wife. This means you love your wives as Christ loved the church. a major challenge he gave up his life for her verse 31 and I want you to highlight this with a pen or if you have your iPad as the scripture says now as the scripture says meaning he's quoting something he's quoting the Old Testament so it's very important that what what the old what is reflected in the old is still established in the new a man leaves his father and mother and join to his wife and the two are united into one. So we'll, we'll talk about that also. So I'm going to talk today, I'm going to teach on the subject, hot. 
Look at the person next to you and tell them it's getting hot in here. But keep your clothes on. <laughs> Look at the other person behind you and say, drop it like it's hot. For your husband or spouse, amen. Grab the person next to you. We're going to pray before we get into God's word. Lord Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your presence, for this opportunity. You gave us the strength to open up our eyes today to whether we came by wheelchair, by walker, or walking in our own two feet. We thank you that we're here. Whether we came by car, by bike, or we hitched a ride, or we came in the bus, we thank you that we're here. Um, and it's not by coincidence. You never do anything by coincidence. You are God of purpose. You are God that is strategic. You know the end from the beginning. And therefore, you have strategically put us here because there is something you want to say to our marriages. There is something you want to say to our single people. That in order for marriage to be a success by the word standard, by the scripture standard, we must obey what the word of God says, what your word says. And we open our hearts to receive mighty name of Jesus, we pull down every mental stronghold, every way of thinking that contradicts Scripture. In the name of Jesus, we pull it down and we, we build something to replace it. We, we replace it with the Word of God. We replace it with, thus says the, the Lord. We replace it with the ancient Scriptures that still have a contemporary application. That, are, that is not tradition, that is absolute truth, that is timeless. And we open our hearts to receive you today. Heal marriages. Restore marriages. Convict us, Lord. For you said in Timothy that the word of God is good for correction, reproof, and for prosperity. You want us to prosper. You want our marriages to prosper. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you all the honor and all the glory in advance for what you've already done and what you're about to do. Because we know you just, we, we just got this party started. For what you're about to do. Come on, put your hands together. Give it up for Jesus. And you may have your seat. I want to encourage you to be an active listener today. So that means be involved in what's, take, make notes and what's being said and what's being taught. Somebody say hot. Come on, say it with an attitude. Someone say hot. hot. When a creator creates a product, when a creator creates a product, for example, Steve Jobs was the creator of the iPhone, the iPad. When a creator creates the product, the creator determines the function, the purpose in which that product should function. The creator determines and defines what that product was created for. The creator will give an instruction manual and say, look, if you want the product to work correctly, you need to follow these instructions. You buy an iPhone or an iPad or an iMac, there's an instruction manual that the creator, Steve Jobs, puts in there so that you can know how to use it correctly. Understand that God is the creator of marriage. He created marriage. And because he is the creator of marriage, he has the right, and he is the only one that has the right to define its purpose and define marriage. Why? Because he is the creator of it. And just because, just like any creator creates a product and gives an instructional manual, how many of y'all know that the creator has given us an instruction manual? It's the word of God. And if we, and if we want our marriage to be successful by scriptures, by the scripture standards, see, we, people define success in a marriage a lot of different ways. There's the world's way, there's your way, but then there's God's way. And God's way is always the best way. 
Why? Because you can never go wrong by following and listening and being obedient to the creator of us and of marriage. See, Steve Jobs created marriage, and he, I'm excuse me, he didn't create marriage, he created the iPad, iPhone. <laughs> but even though he created the iPhone and the iPad, you still, as the consumer, you still have the choice to use this iPad however you want. Even though he's given us the instruction manual, even though he's already defined how an iPad should be correctly used for surfing the internet, you can take a $400 iPad and you can use it as a coffee coaster if you wanted to. You can take a $400 iPad and you can use it to scoop up trash with it. There's his way and there's your way. And you have that choice. He, he doesn't, if you want to do that, that, that's you. If you want to use something that was created to surf the internet to scoop up trash, then you sell yourself short on the benefits that this iPad or whatever Apple product has. And understand that God does not force anybody to follow his instructions. Why? Because he is a God of love. Love does not dictate. Love does not force. And understand, you have, you have every choice to do it your way, the world's way, the movie's way, or you can do it God's way. See, but when you do it your way, you can eventually scoop up mess into your marriage that can destroy your marriage, that can divide your marriage. When you do it your way, you can eventually scoop up trash into your life that will ruin you and you won't be able to walk in the blessings that God has for your life. But I don't know about you, but are there some married couples here that, that are ready to upload, download God's blessings so you can see success uploaded into your marriage? <laughs> oh, you shout louder at the cantina. I said, are there any marriages here that are ready to download God's word and be obedient so you can upload success into your life? Well, I created an acrostic, hot, and it's inspired from the scriptures. An acrostic, there's a lot of acrostics, H-B-O, H-E-B. So this, dare, but this is one, and, and if you're taking notes, obviously it shows behind what the, the acrostic symbolizes. It means honor, openness, and take. Honor, openness, and take. Now, if we're going to see our marriages flaming hot and not cold with the influence of the world, if we're going to see it hot in obedience and hot with God's blessings and not cold with unscriptural, destructive human traditions that, that influence, that maybe you've allowed to influence your marriage. We, we need, to, we need to make sure that our lives are submitted. Our marriages, uh, Sister Debbie was talking about surrender. We need to make sure that our, our marriages are surrendered to God. So, first of all, there has to be honor. Someone say honor. We must honor what the Scripture says about how to conduct our marriage. So, Paul tells us here, first thing he tells us, both husbands... Both. Someone say both. It's not one way. It's not just the, 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 the wife submitting to the husband. As some preachers may preach. He says both should submit to one another. It's in different ways. But nevertheless, there has to be mutual submission. You need to stop looking at your marriage as individuals and need to see your marriage as a team. You are not individuals if you are married. In God's eyes, you are one. And if you treat your marriage as individuals, you are individually going to break down. See, look at teams. You can look at any team. I don't care if it's a team within hockey, 
soccer, or for us Mexicans, football. <laughs> There's different, different gifts, different attitudes, different personalities. But when they submit to each other and they unite their gifts, their talents, their different attitudes, they are able for the greater benefit of the team to achieve victory. Doesn't mean that they're not different. Doesn't mean that they have different skill levels, intelligence levels, but yet they're submitting to each other for a greater cause. You look at a business, and the business has its CEO, and its president, and its vice president, and its different divisions, and its underbosses, and its employees, all filled with different, different types of education, different attitudes, different cultures, different backgrounds, but yet they unite their gifts and talents for the mission and for the vision of the company. And in spite of having their differences, when they unite together as a team, and that takes submission to do that, when they do that, they're able to achieve victory or success for the greater benefit of the company. And that's the same thing with marriage. Doesn't mean that you, you lose your personality or that uh, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that, you know, your husband is smarter than you. Because I'll, I'll come out and just say, my wife is a lot smarter than me. Doesn't mean that for, it, what it means is that God wants you to unite. If you will use your differences and your different gifts and your different personalities for their overall greater benefit of your marriage and for the glorification of God. How many of y'all know victory can be achieved? Longevity can be achieved. Divorce can be overcome. So one of the first ways that we, Paul mentions here is women should submit to man as Christ, as the church submits to Jesus. And submission does not imply weakness. <laughs> the most powerful man that ever walked this earth had to submit to God in order for his will to be accomplished on this earth. In fact, if there is no submission in, in, in a believer's life, there is no authority and there is no power. Because you cannot represent something that you are not surrendered to. You cannot have authority to represent a God that you do not have a relationship with. But yet Jesus was powerful because he was submitted to God. Jesus was able to rebuke demons and rebuke storms and multiply two fish and five loaves and open blind eyes and raise the dead because there was submission to God. And let me tell you something, wives, imagine the power and the change that you can bring to your marriage, to your kids, to your community, to the future generations that will come after you if you will submit to the leadership of your husband. To be a head, when the, when the Bible calls the man the head of the household, headship is leadership. Now, once again, it's not saying to listen to to submit to everything he says, obviously, if it contradicts Scripture, if it draws you away from God, how many of y'all know you don't submit to that? But the thing is, when you submit, this, and this is not my opinion, when you submit to the leadership of your husband, there's a lot of great that can come out of that. Never bad. As a wife, you must be the helper of your husband. And once again, helper does not imply that man is superior and that woman is inferior. And I'll explain that. Let me give you the example. There are a lot of things that I would not have been able to accomplish in my life had it not been for my wife. When we first got together, I just... Barely grabbed my GED, barely obtained it, and, and I was planning on just leaving it like that. I wasn't looking forward to furthering any of my education. But my wife, who was my girlfriend at that time, was pushing me. She said, you need to, you need to go beyond the GED. And today, I, I'm, I'm working on getting my doctorate. <laughs> so 
two master's degrees, and I'm not boasting, but what I'm telling you is the encouragement and the push didn't come from me. It came from my wife. Us being in this building, I didn't have the faith for this building. My wife did. It wasn't even my idea. I was looking at some other 19 tiralo <laughs> building. And my wife said, you know what? We need to do something bigger than that. We need to do something nicer than that. When, when, my, when my mother passed away, anybody that knows me, that's known me since I've grown up, knows that I'm very strong mentally. As a young person, I saw people, I saw my first murder when I was 14. I, my best friend died and killed at the age of 19. Grown up in poverty, experienced tragedy in my life, very young, traumatized with stuff that my dad did to my mom. Living with my grandma, mom was on, on welfare and didn't have a car. She would get a car and it would, I experienced a lot of traumatic stuff. And I was a strong individual, but when my mom died, it shook my life. Never in my life had I experienced anxiety in my life. And when my mom passed away in the first month, I went to the ER about three times because I thought I was dying. I thought I was having a heart attack. I felt like there was an elephant sitting on my chest. And I went into a deep depression because of that. But you know, through it all, my wife stuck with me and encouraged me and prayed with me and allowed me to vent and say, you can't quit, you've come too far. See, I was not able, I'm not able to do what I have been called to do on my own. I don't have enough abilities. I don't got the right stuff. So God has sent me a helper. And when the Bible says, when God was creating the earth, and he saw, he created the plants, and he said it was good. He created the animals, and he said it was good. But when he saw that man was by himself, he said it was not good. The word good in the original language of the Hebrew means not functioning according to purpose. Because good means functioning. It means purpose. So man could not function according to God's purpose for his life because he was missing something. He didn't have everything within his own abilities to do what God had called him to do. So God said, I'm going to send you a helper. And he created Eve. And the Bible says, and then he called it good. He says, now you can fulfill God's purpose for your life. Where Eve is weak, you're strong. Where, where, where you're weak, Eve is strong. And I want to tell you, women, your, men needs, your man, your husband needs your encouragement. Your, your husband needs to know that you are behind him and that you support him. And if your husband ain't the spiritual giant that you would like him to be, you need to encourage him into that headship and into that leadership position. Your husband needs you just as much as you need him. The question is, what are you doing to help your husband? Are you helping him or are you hurting him? Are you helping him or are you hurting him? See, God is looking for some women that are ready to help their husband. I wonder if there are any of those women here this morning that say, I'm ready to help. Men, the Bible says that we must submit to our wives by, by treating them and leading them and loving them as Jesus treated and loved the church. One of the things that we see is that Jesus sacrificed for the church. He empowered the church through his teaching. He empowered the church. Men, are you empowering your wife? When Jesus comes again, or, or when death concludes your marriage, your wife ought to be a different person than the woman he sent you when y'all said, I do. And what I mean different, she ought to be a better, she ought to be a stronger, 
a more stable, a more spiritual person than when you first said, I do. The question is, what are you doing to empower her? Are you helping her or are you hurting her? Is she moving forward or is she going back because of you? See, man, you need to empower your wives. Another thing that we see is that Jesus loved the church. Jesus loved the church. Jesus not only sacrificed for the church, he spent time with the church. One of the ways that I, I love my wife is I give her my time. You know, I, with college, with ministry, with a growing church, with a whole bunch of other issues. Because let me tell you something. Let me give you a little insight, an insight to what goes on. Church is not all about preaching. There's a lot of other things that go on behind the scenes that go on 24-7. But you know what? I give my wife my time. And how do I do that? I make sure at least one time a week that she gets my undivided attention. And this is not something that we've just started. It's something I've done since we've gotten married. I make sure twice out of the year we go somewhere. I don't care if it's to Kitty Park or the Aqueducts, <laughs> Six Flags. Twice out, of the, twice out of the year, I make sure that we do something. And you know what? A lot of times, I don't have the time in my schedule. But you know what? I make time. And I'll cancel stuff. I'll clear my schedule. Why? Because love is more than just words. It's action. It's action. And, 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 and I make sure that she gets my undivided Attention. Why? Because other than God, and when I say God, I say my relationship with God. She is the most important thing in my life. I have good friends. I have childhood friends that I, I have been friends with, but guess what? My wife is still more important than they are. I love being a pastor, and I love doing ministry. And I love preaching, but guess what's more important than doing ministry and preaching? My wife. And for some of you that are confused by these preachers that don't know how to, preach, uh, how to teach Scripture correctly, your number one ministry should be with God, your relationship with God, your family, and then your church ministry. See, doing the work of God and being a person of God are two different things. Being a person of God has to do with your, the relationship, what you invest in your relationship with God. Now, I know what you are saying. Good, awesome. I can miss church because I can have church anywhere. Look, being a pastor or coming to church is not my number one priority. My relationship with God is my, my marriage is. But look how serious I am about ministry. <laughs> you ask any of these leaders, I am dead serious about making sure that this church is empowered and blessed and going somewhere. <laughs> Y'all have heard of hood rats? Well, me and my wife have been church rats since we've been boyfriend and girlfriend, we take coming to church seriously all the time. We're church rats. The point being is just because God is, should be your relationship with God and your relationship with your spouse should be over church, doing church, doesn't mean that you should not come, doesn't mean that you should not make coming to church, ser take it seriously. You should. Do not forsake the dwelling of the brethren. Where two or three are gathered in my name, whatever they ask for, they shall have. One can put a hundred to flight. Two can put a thousand to flight. Three can put ten thousand. You best believe that there's something that happens when you come with other brothers and sisters and praise and worship God. So, but by, by no means am I saying that this is not important. It is very important. But what's more important is my relationship with God and my relationship with my wife. Jimmy Evans, and any pastor that tells you otherwise don't know what they're saying. I'll tell you that right now. 
They ain't reading the scripture. They're reading tradition. Jimmy Evans, who's one of the speakers at the Gateway Conference, um, he's very big on marriage. And he says, for many, blood is thicker than water. And that's true. He said, but there is a relationship that is thicker than your biological relationship with your parents, or should be, with your mom or dad. There is, or your, your brothers or your biological sisters, there is a relationship that is thicker than blood. And that is the spiritual union that takes place when you get married. I reference in the beginning of this sermon that Paul is quoting the Old Testament. It was said in the Old by God, and it's said in the New by Him. He's emphasizing it. And he says in, in Genesis chapter 2.24, he says, For this reason a man should leave his mother and father to become one with his wife. Blood is thicker than water, correct. But there is a relationship that should be thicker, that you should give more priority, and that should be to the husband and the spouse or the, the wife that God has placed in your life. Because if, if your spouse, if your wife or your husband is not number one, is not your top priority other than your relationship with God, guess what? Your marriage is heading for a disaster. If you love your parents more than you love your spouse, it's can, it, can, it, can, it can cause division. It can hinder the marriage from growing. Well, I don't believe what you said. Good thing I didn't say it. <laughs> Good thing God said it. So, when there is a marriage, what the Bible is saying, there is a shift of priorities. They should be a shift of priorities. Becoming one is more than just having sex. Becoming one is communication. Becoming one is facing tragedy together. It's arguing. It's providing. It's protecting. It's all of the above of what marriage is about. And the question is, is your husband your top priority? Do you, is, other than God, do you, or do you love your friends more than do you love spending time with your husband? Do you love your mama or daddy? And, and God is not saying, for, for those of y'all, well, well that you're saying to just forget about your parents? No, just like I had mentioned earlier, even though church ministry and my friends uh, are not my top priority, I take it very seriously. Abraham took care of his parents. He didn't disown them. That's not what he's saying. But, but what the Bible is saying that your number one priority, other than your relationship with God, should not be a friend. If you love spending time with your friends more than you love spending time with your spouse, that's a red flag. If you love spending time more with your Xbox than you do with your husband or wife, that's a red flag. That spouse might be your ex if that happens. If you love your parents more than you love your spouse, that's a red flag. I have never seen a marriage succeed when the spouse loves their parents more than they love their husband or wife. I've seen it last miserably. But understand what I want to challenge you today this is the point I'm trying to make is love is more than just words. If you say you love your wife, are you making time for her? Are you spending time together? I'm not talking about I love being around groups of people and all that. I'm talking about Let's just clear our schedule. Let's just not go out with this. Let's just me and you. We're going to go on a date. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. I want to give you all my, I was getting my hair cut, and one of the ladies was laughing at me because I told her when we, when we went to New York and we went to other places, we, my wife and I stayed up walking the streets of New York doing things till about 4 or 5 in the morning. We went to Europe. We stayed out till like 3 or 4 in the morning. See, how many of y'all know dating should not stop once you get married? If I could party in the world with my friends, then surely I can party and get romantic 
with my wife. And let me tell you, married people, if you can uh, wine and dine when you were a boyfriend and girlfriend, how much more now the dating should not stop, the spending time should not stop, the love act should not stop. It, it should increase. Your ceremony in saying I do is not, is, is, is not a destination. It's a stepping stone to grow in love for each other. Can I get an amen? So the next one is openness. Someone say openness. There has to be an open communication in the marriage with God. Genesis 2.25 says, and they were both naked and were not ashamed. They were naked. No clothes on. This is both literally and figurative. They were not ashamed. There was nothing, they were not ashamed to be in the presence of God. And they were not ashamed to be naked in front of each other. There was an openness, literally and figuratively. They didn't hold nothing back in their feelings for each other. And communicating to each other. They held nothing back in that regards. And if marriage is to succeed according, if we were to see success according to the scripture standards, there needs to be an openness. We need, as a, as a married couple, you should be open. There should be an open line of communication with God. Both of you should pray and seek God. Both of you should strive to come to church. Both of you should try and make an attempt to spend time in God's word. Both of you, how many of y'all know, we, both of us as a married couple, we must spend time, we must have church outside of church. You come to church, we only have church one Sunday here. And the rest of the other hours, you're out there getting influenced, being tempted. See, how many of y'all know we need to have church in here and we need to have church outside of church. We need to be praying and seeking God, not just as individuals, but as team marriage. So there needs to be an openness with God, a communication with God. There needs to be an open communication between you and your spouse. One of the things that causes teams to succeed or corporations to succeed when there's different personalities, different skills, different uh, intellectual levels is that there is communication. If there is no communication, it will not succeed. If there's no communication, they will not succeed. See, the Garden of Eden was Adam and Eve's safe haven to that where they could be naked with God and with themselves. And your spouse, husband or wife, ought to be your safe haven to where you can communicate and express your feelings and not be in fear of them cussing you out or not... Be in fear of getting beat up. Or not be in fear of saying, you know what, can you just shut up because that's not important. When you're trying to express yourself. There needs to be open communication. If there's no open communication, the marriage will struggle. And not only that, but when they are communicating, when a wife is... Because I'll tell you one thing. Women talk a lot more than men. And I've said this before. You ask a man how his day went, oh, it went good. <laughs> if you ask a woman how her day went, she'll tell you what she ate for breakfast. She'll tell you the temperature, what high heels, and what girl got on her nerves or what guy got on his, her nerves. She'll tell you everything. But how many of y'all know as men, we need to hear them out? Because that's the way God created them. And we need, to, we, need, we need to show active listening. There's a big deal. Okay, I'll let you say what you want to say. And you ever seen Charlie Brown when they would talk on the speaker? Blah, 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 blah. 
I'm listening to you, and, and, and as she's talking, all you hear, blah, 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 blah. There needs to be active listening. And active listening is not thinking of a comeback while they're talking. That's not active listening. <laughs> it's not a put-down contest. <laughs> now, I know there's some of you introverts. I can't do this because I'm an introvert. I get a kick out of when people say that. Because that may be true. That may be your personality type that you are an introvert. But let me tell you something. Think of all the things that you have been able to do that you have developed that when you didn't have the skill or knowledge, you, but you had the passion. And your passion drove you to develop, to seek the knowledge and develop the skills in order to do what you can do right now. And if you can do that for a vocation, if you can do that to learn how to fish or put together a motor, if you can do that to learn how to do your nails correctly <laughs> or figure out how to put long eyelashes on or horse hair on, when you didn't know, you, you looked on YouTube, you looked everywhere, you bought this person's book, if you can look up how to flip houses and how to, you know, all, if we can do that for vocation or skill or hobbies, how much more, if you're an introvert, that you can do that and develop that for your spouse? There has to be a passion for that. And if you are going to succeed in your marriage according to the standards of the Scripture, if there's going to be success as defined by the Scriptures, there are some things that you must develop that you don't have. Uh, one thing I had to develop in my, in my marriage that I did not bring to the table, and don't act like you don't have something to develop, because we all got some things that we don't bring to the table. That's just the way it is, but you can't not just stand there and let that happen. My wife loves to be hugged. She loves to be, uh, for me to put my hands through her hair, for me to, and, and I'm not talking about sexual touch. Because men, if the only time is, that's the only time you're touching your woman, there's something wrong. Because women, can, can I get some help here? How many of y'all know the touching should be at all times? The caressing, the loving, the signs of affection should not just be when y'all getting freaky deaky. It should be at all times. But that's something, because I never had a dad, that's something I had to develop. So I, I sought out marriages that, I, I, that uh, projected good examples, that, 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 that displayed this value of affectionate touch. And, and guess what? I, I've developed it. It took me some while, but I've, been, I've developed that. Why? Because I have a passion, and that's what my wife wants. And well, I'm going to develop that and not use the excuse that that's just something I don't have. First, First Timothy 4, 7 says, exercise yourself unto godliness. Exercise. Someone say exercise. exercise. That word exercise means to strip one's clothes in the original language of the Greek. The Olympics, when Paul was writing this, he got the inspiration and, uh, from the Olympics. The, the Olympics was in its infancy at that time. But there was pancreation fighters. These guys would box and punch and wrestle. Um, Gecko-Roman wrestling came from that. But one of the things that they would do is that they would fight naked. I don't know if I would want to be in that Olympics. <laughs> but, but they would fight naked. But there was a purpose behind it. They would strip their clothes and they would fight naked. Because they believed that clothing kept them from fighting at their fullest potential. So they would strip any clothing or garments and they would fight naked. So they could fight at their maximum potential. So here's what Paul's trying to say. Here's a spiritual application. He's trying to say we ought to strip aside attitudes and sin and obstacles. Hebrews 12, lay aside every weight and sin that so easily holds you down. We ought to strip everything that's keeping us from serving God and loving God. But we ought to take that same mentality in marriage. 
We ought to strip aside every attitude, every sin, every bitterness, every obstacle that is keeping husband and wife from drawing closer to God. Let me tell you something. No one's going to do it for you. You have to do it. You have to be in agreement. And how many of y'all know we got to strip aside every attitude and every obstacle that is keeping you from drawing close to your husband? See, because when you strip aside the weight, the sin, the attitudes that is keeping you from serving God at your maxim, maximum potential or loving each other at your maximum potential, guess what? You can win wars. You can win battles that have defeated you in the past. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual principalities. Let me tell you something. A couple that talks to God can talk to demons and rebuke them. A couple that spends time talking to God can speak to mountains and the mountains will move. But it comes by, there has to be an openness of communication. Someone say honor. Someone say openness. Now someone say take. We must take responsibilities for our actions and stop playing the blaming, the blame game. We must take responsibilities for our actions and stop playing the blame game. When God confronted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, guess what they started doing? They started playing the blame game. Adam started blaming God, and he started blaming Eve. It was was the woman you gave me. Rather than taking responsibility for his own action, you will never demonstrate teamwork playing the blame game. I'm not a good husband because I never had a dad. I'm not a good wife, or uh, I I don't forgive, and, 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 and I don't express my feelings because I never saw that growing up. I'm easily offended and get and hold on to certain things because I was rejected when I was young. We put all these blame, the blame games of why we can't be a good husband or a good dad. But how long are you going to allow the failures of your parents or your ba- or your grandparents to dictate the success in your marriage? See. I remember at 10.30 in the morning, I went to my my dad's room when he was just got married to my mom, and he was already drinking a beer. My dad left my mom after a few months of just getting married with her. He never sent child support. He never provided for her. He never protected her. There was no hugging. There was no, he left her for dead, both of us. But if I use that as an excuse, if I allow that to make me a failure as a husband, then I'm becoming a victim of my environment. But the devil is a liar. Because God has not created me a victim. God has created me to be victorious over that. I don't care if my dad did it. I don't care what he did do or what he didn't do. Guess what? I'm going to break that cycle and I'm going to be a loving husband. I'm going to be a providing husband. I'm going to be a protecting husband. I'm going to be a God-fearing husband and I'm not going to run away when things get hard and when things get tough. And I want to tell you something. Stop playing the blame game. God says that you are more than overcomers. God says that if God before you, who can be against you? God is behind your marriage. God has given you the power. Romans 8, 11 says that the very same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave now lives in our mortal bodies. It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about right now. The power is in the inside of you. The power is within your marriage. When are you going to stop playing the blame game and start using the power that God has put in the inside you and rebuke the devils, repent and confess of those sins that's been holding you down? And that may be my grandparents. That may be my great-grandparents. That may have been my mom or dad. But honey, baby, that is not going to be us because we're better than that. We're bigger than that. We got Jesus on our side. Who cares if your dad is a drunk? You don't have to be a drunk. 
Who cares if you got molested? You don't have to molest your children. You don't have to believe, uh, beat your children just because you are beaten. You don't got to give your wife the silent treatment or you don't got to give your husband the silent treatment just because your parents gave you the silent treatment. You are more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus. It's about time you start acting like it. I'll leave with this. You can stand to your feet. Second Samuel twenty four ten. Twenty four twenty five also. God told David, Don't count the number of soldiers that you have. He said, Don't count the number of soldiers that you have. Nothing wrong with counting. But David was counting soldiers, his motive was wrong. In doing it. It's not what he was doing. It was the motive behind what he was doing. And he was counting them because he was showing, he was obtaining his strength from people rather than God. And that's not what God had called him to do. And the Bible said that God convicted him. And you know what David did? Rather than playing the blame game or pointing fingers, the Bible says that David responded immediately to the conviction of God And he confessed and he repented. And David said, I'm going to buy some land. And I'm going to build an altar on it. And they offered to give him the land for free. And David said, I will not build something that doesn't cost me nothing. And David said, you ain't going to give me the land for free. I'm going to buy it. And David built an altar to the Lord on that land. And he began to worship God. And he saved the entire nation from plague. And let me tell you something. When God convicts you, when God has convicted your marriage, don't let it linger. Respond quickly. What you don't deal with now will eventually deal with you. There's some here, what God is asking you to do may cost you something may cost ungodly friendships that are holding your marriage back. May cost some ungodly hobbies that that is destroying your marriage. May may cost you uh, to rethink how you view marriage. It may cost you to, 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 to rewrite how you've been governing your marriage. Stop doing it your way. I need to do it God's way because He is the Creator. But you know what? It may cost you. It may not happen overnight, but can I tell you that what God wants to build in your life and in your marriage is worth it? He wants to build some altars of holiness in your marriage. He wants to build some altars of faithfulness in your marriage. He wants to build your, some altars to where it's not verbal abuse or putting down each other, but you're going to start speaking words that will encourage your wife, encourage your husband. Speak words that will bless them and not curse them. It may cost you something, but guess what? What God wants to build in your marriage, how many of y'all know it's worth it? It will save your marriage from plague. It will save your marriage from destruction. It will save the heartache of pain that Satan and the world wants to bring against your marriage and against your kids. my forever love you are my forever